Good morning. This is another lecture in the History 1301 series about the Second Great Awakening. Second Great Awakening is an allusion uh, historically to a religious, a large religious revival that took place in the United States from approximately the year 1801 till about 1845 or 50. The uh, Second Great Awakening is not actually one single revival event, but really uh, three or four or more religious uh, awakenings, religious revivals, uh, predominantly found in the Christian religion uh, and different aspects and denominations of Christianity. Uh, that is uh, going to sweep the uh, American nation during that time period. The Second Great Awakening is actually a much, much larger awakening uh, than its namesake. The First Great Awakening that we touched on in an earlier lecturing class with uh, J Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and all those fellows. The Second Great Awakening is really going to set the religious tapestry of the United States that is affect, <coughs> excuse me, that is felt all the way to the present time. Uh, it'll have a wide-ranging impact beyond just that of the church. It is a large impact of not only just the uh, uh, the uh, church, but also say on social movements, uh, causes, uh, and so forth. Uh, it impacts uh, it impacts race and religion. Uh, it impacts even uh, gender and sex and, and what have you. Not sex like in the act, but I'm talking about uh, gender in the sense of male versus female. All that to say is the Second Great Awakening is uh, sometimes overlooked, but I think, frankly, one of the most important things that uh, we could take a look at here uh, and discuss for just a few minutes of our time. Excuse me a second while I grab a book. The Second Great Awakening, oh, let's see, where are you at? The Second Great Awakening, ah, you're a new good, this is when you get one of those, the times when you wish you'd have just grabbed this at the outset and just set it down on, in your lap. All right, there we go. The Second Great Awakening is uh, really going to take off uh, in several facets. We'll start off with the more ecumenical sides uh, and uh, discussions. Kind of set the uh, groundwork for the way the United States looked in and around the year 1800. Uh, as it's already been touched on in class and in lecture and in, in the uh, textbook Unto a Good Land, one of the issues coming out of the American Revolution is what do you do with religion? Now, sometimes uh, the, it's a myth, really, in some respects, is, is that when you had the Bill of Rights uh, and you had the American Revolution, it disestablished religion altogether, and religion was cast out into the public sphere, uh, cast out of the public sphere uh, into merely private hands, and that's, that's really kind of a half-truth. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is, is we remember the First Amendment talks about Congress shall make no law. The states can do that uh, prior to the 14th Amendment. Uh, the states can keep uh, organized religion, keep established religion even, uh, prior to the 14th Amendment, which is a Reconstruction Civil War era amendment in the 1860s. The fact of the matter is, is that uh, despite uh, that statement right there, you will see a general decline of, in fact, a dis disestablishment, a breaking of the official bonds of a colony, now state, with, an, with a denomination, say like uh, Congregationalism with Connecticut. Uh, a preacher you probably need to write down because he is the father of some very famous uh, children. In fact, in his own time, Lyman Beecher, L-Y-M-A-N. Lyman Beecher was a famous theologian preacher in his own right. Uh, he is a thoroughgoing Christian, but he's kind of ecumenical. And when I use the word ecumenical, that means kind of uh, across the aisles, across the denominations, reach across, shake hands, uh, find common ground, work together where you can, that sort of thing. Uh, Lyman Beecher, uh, worth noting, is going to be the father of several, uh, in fact, a lot of children. But two of his children become very prominent in their own right. Uh, one of his sons, Henry Ward Beecher, uh, in the Civil War and post-Civil War era, becomes a very famous preacher uh, in uh, in America. Really, kind of a kind of a Joel Osteen style. I probably whipped and used Joel Osteen's name way too much at times when I talk about religion, uh, but certainly in a social gospel uh, downplay the theology, downplay the doctrine, play, uh, talk up, uh, talk up uh, the self-help, uh, talk up the uh, the uplift, uh, the you know the, the aspects, kind of an anti-Calvinist in a sense. Uh, Henry Ward Beecher uh, would also be caught up in a, a major sex scandal in his lifetime. But uh, for our 1301 class, we're really more interested in the other woman, other girl uh, in the clan, uh, and they had, uh, like I said, a bunch of kids. But the two that I'll just highlight to you very briefly uh, is uh, Julia. 
Oh, gosh. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, not Julia. Harriet Beecher Stowe. Harry Beecher Stowe, if you're thinking about it, you just think, I've heard that name before. Some of you already know what she is uh, famous for. Some of you know what famous book she wrote. Uh, and it is said that it was her book that helped bring on the Civil War. And that book is Uncle Tom's Cabin. Whether it's true or not, we'll discuss that more uh, in the uh, lecture uh, that uh, is called uh, The Coming of the Civil War. But Harriet Beecher Stowe is one of the offspring of Lyman Beecher's uh, uh, family. Well, anyways, uh, Lyman Beecher is uh, going to be in despair in about 1818. He looks around and he sees the, con uh, the Congregational Church disestablished, and he goes into kind of a, a state of melancholy, a state of despair, depression, and what have you. What will happen to religion? Well, uh, there are a lot of folks who worried that when you disestablished religion, when you took away the official support of church, the excuse me, the official support of the state in the form of money, or sanction, or privilege and position, which, by the way, had been the play, uh, practice, which had been the practice for years, 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 and years in the history of Christianity, uh, the practice of disestablishing the churches and letting the churches do what they want to do and the state staying largely away from the church and the church away from the state within reason and detail, of course, and qualification. But the fact is uh, that's an American practice. Uh, it's been followed elsewhere, but that's an American practice. Uh, but for the vast uh, history of the church, the, wherever the church was, and the, if the church was, a, was the majority uh, religion, it was oftentimes the official religion. Uh, not always, but often. But anyways, but Lyman Beecher looks at this and says, oh my gosh, what will happen? And when the churches are disestablished, uh, there was a lot of question. What will happen to religion? Will people fall away completely? Will this mean the end of the church? Uh, well, no, it didn't. In fact, actually, what's interesting is, is that the disestablishment of the churches and the disestablishment of religion in the United States in the post-revolutionary period actually brings on one of the greatest eras in the church history in the United States. Really, you can make the argument, and I, and I qualify it more if you've had me for a 1302, you know what I say there. But in the 19th century especially, you see the United States, especially prior to the Civil War, but you see the United States be far more observant, far more religious, and in some cases maybe far more believers than you find in its European counterparts. In the 19th century, it is uh, speculated and frankly probably determined or rather demonstrated by statistics and, and uh, anecdote and uh, uh, oral history and written history that it, Europe was going through a decline and a falling away of faith. And a lot of folks still went to church. A lot of folks still had faith. But maybe they only went because that's what they were supposed to do. A kind of a, a, a social Christianity or a, a public Christianity, but not a faith of the heart. Well, that's not the case in the 19th century in the United States. I'm not just here to tell you that everybody who was in the United States in the, uh, in the antebellum period, the pre-Civil War period, had be, were all Christians lock, stock, and barrel. No, that's not true. There were many men and women who did not believe. There were many men and women who were skeptical. There were many men who were believers, but just not Christian believers. So, uh, but at the same time, religion does flourish in the antebellum period. Uh, Lyman Beecher himself goes from being a man who is worried about the future of the church to being somebody who is uh, considered to be a very good preacher and a very good promoter of religion, a promoter of faith, and a promoter of his, his understanding of Christianity, kind of a congregational understanding, an ecumenical. Somebody else worth noting here uh, in this ecumenical uh, outlook, he's a very prominent Christian and a very prominent evangelist uh, in this time period, is a fellow named uh, Charles Grandison Finney. Charles Grandison Finney. Of all the, the revival preachers, uh, perhaps Finney is the most prominent. Finney was no believer uh, into his early, uh, early 20s. He was a lawyer. He was a good lawyer. And uh, the way the story goes is he went off uh, one day to think about, uh, got to, uh, he was talking to one of his uh, a potential client, goes off, reads the Bible, and then comes back and says, I've got a bigger and more important client. I'm going to work for God. Well, Grandison Finney is going to uh, essentially establish a type of Christianity uh, that is moving away from old line Calvinism. Now, that's something to remember. 
We've talked about Calvinism at various times in the semester. You talk about it in the form of Calvin himself uh, in the Geneva uh, situation. Then you talk about the Puritans and how they believe <clears throat> in a very sovereign God, a very determined God, a, ver a God who calls some but uh, does not call others to salvation. Uh, he elects some. He does not elect others. It's a very uh, mystical at times. Uh, how do you know you're saved? Well, you just kind of... Uh, you think you know it, it's kind of an emotion of a heart sort of thing. And there's nothing, remember, with Calvinism that you can do that can influence God and say, you know what, I choose for God. You don't do it that way with Calvinism. God calls you to uh, through grace, uh, calls you by grace through faith. And that when the grace pours out in your heart, the faith awakens and then you can't help but run to it. And that's Calvinism. Prior to the Revolution, if you were a Christian, most Christians in the United States, the future United States, were Calvinists. Uh, yes, you have uh, pockets of Roman Catholicism here or there, and you've got pockets of other groups here or there, but it's basically some form of Calvinism, whether it's Presbyterian Calvinism or Congregational Calvinism, and so on. But during the, Civil, during, during the American Revolution and after the American Revolution, you will find you will find a good number of folks who just simply, the, the faith kind of burned over a little bit, meaning it burned out some. Um, and so in the 1780s and the 1790s, and even in the early 1800s, uh, first, say the first decade, uh, there were a lot of folks indifferent to faith. But Grandison Finney, he is going to uh, kind of move away from that Calvinistic determinism. determinism. And he's going to go and he's going to start, he's not talking about the movement of the Holy Spirit to save people, but it's the work of the evangelist to save people. Uh, and it's the work, and it's humans who come to God. Uh, and in fact, his is very theatrical. If you've ever been to a, uh, a church service where there's a lot of theat uh, theater, as it were, a lot of acting and drama, and I don't mean that like in a, you know, a Easter pageant or anything like that, but I mean the preacher is full of emotion, kind of like as I did in class, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that Elisha character that I talked about with the Scotch-Irish, who came back and he was all this and the hands were waving and what have you, Finney could do that. Finney was an educated man and he was a good lawyer and he created uh, kind of some, I would call gimmicks, but he certainly uh, produced uh, practices that are like in one case called the anxious bench, sometimes called the mourner's bench, I've seen it. But the anxious bench is where you would invite somebody who was uh, not a Christian, but you brought them to the front row and you, you really went to work on them. Sometimes you'd preach right to them. Uh, when I do that, that means I'm preaching right to them, I'm standing up and looking down. But all that to say is that anxious bench and other facets of these great this great revival movement was Finneyism, uh, and the Calvinists at first thought Finney was uh, fr uh, friendly to him. But the longer Finney went, the more it was obvious that he was not really much of a Calvinist, but he was much more of a, what you might call in your notes an Arminian. And so, uh, but Finney, though, he could break bread with Congregationalist and Baptist and Methodist and other groups, and he was kind of all over the place. But his, his goal was to save people and uh, to save as many as you can, to borrow a phrase from uh, 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 Charles Haddon Spurgeon. But all that to say, though, is that those are two examples right there of this, uh, this Second Great Awakening. But you find the Second Great Awakening uh, beyond the ecumenical, beyond the, the, the celebrity preacher. Uh, they were the thing about um, Finney and uh, Lyman Beecher and other uh, individuals like that. They're trying to to grow the numbers of the church, but not a specific church. They're trying to save as many as you can, but not bring them into one church or one denomination. That also that's not always going to be the case. In fact, they were really kind of uh, the outstanding minority. Outstanding, not like in a good way. I'm not saying anything against them. But they're just the, the conspicuous minority. Uh, when we talk about the real growth of the Second Great Awakening and which churches really blossomed under this establishment and this new awakening of faith and religion, especially Protestant Christianity, uh, is there are many denominations that are going to come of age and grow up and explode, and such as, uh, for example, the Uni Unitarian Universalists. They come, uh, come out of this. A Unitarian would believe that there uh, is one God. Tr the idea of the Trinity was ridiculous, and Jesus was probably not divine. Uh, a Universalist would say that God saves all, and he doesn't let anybody f go to hell. Uh, that would be, the, in essence, of the, uh, the Universalist position, and eventually you'll see the Unitarian Universalist uh, join in the 20th century. 
You'll see other groups that I'm not going to talk about because of time constraints, uh, such as, say, the Church of Christ uh, or the Disciples of Christ. Uh, they come out of the Stone Campbell movement, and they're kind of a, a restorationist uh, Christianity uh, in the sense that uh, they they hearken back and they claim uh, the, the, the Church of Christ, the Disciples of Christ, before they split uh, in the late 19th century or the 20th century, I believe it might have been. Uh, but they talk about how they're restoring the church to the primitive, pure New Testament period. And they have their own particular beliefs and so forth uh, with regard to uh, baptisms and so on. But all that to say, though, is, is that when we talk about uh, the, the movements and the churches that really explode in this uh, Second Great Awakening time period, really two stand out. Uh, and, uh, and the first one we'll deal with here is the biggest of them. And that is the Methodist church, Methodism. Now, a couple of, some of you watching this uh, might have grown up in a Methodist church, and what I'm about to talk about with a Methodist may surprise you a great, great deal, because uh, you're pro if you come from a Methodist church, it's not always true, but in many cases, a Methodist church today is uh, uh, very solid, very stolid, very qu perhaps quiet. There is worship uh, um, and so on, but it's, it's not rambunctious and, and jaunty and people maybe speaking in tongues or what have you. But in the early days of Methodism in the United States, it was very, very rambunctious. Methodism is actually going to grow out of the Church of England. It's uh, the other word for the Church of England, Anglicanism. Methodism in the time of the American Revolution was small and insignificant. Methodism, even as late as 1800, was small and insignificant. Methodism had very few people. In fact, actually, let's see here, I look at it. At the time of the American Revolution in the, uh, in the American colonies, there were no more than 50 Methodist churches in America. In about 60, excuse me, in about, let's see here, 90, about 90 years later, you're going to have 20,000 churches, so it blew up. Well, Methodism actually comes from the, uh, um, the work of two brothers. Some of you are familiar with their names. And if you ever heard of uh, John and Charles Wesley, or you've ever heard of Texas Wesleyan University, or ten uh, you know, te uh, Tennessee Wesleyan, or some other, something has Wesley or Wesley in it, Wesleyan, that probably is either a Methodist-affiliated school or at least one time was. Uh, say if you have John Wesley Harden, who was a great and famous, uh, uh, well, basically murderer in, te in late 19th century Texas history, John Wesley Harden was born of a father who was a Methodist preacher. Obviously, that seed uh, fell far from the tree. Well, anyways, all that to say, though, is, is that John and, Wesley, uh, John and Charles Wesley, John Wesley was the preacher theologian. Charles Wesley was the, uh, uh, the song and hymn writer. Uh, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Actually, if you have a hymn book, uh, because you remember singing these in church, uh, maybe you come from a church where they sang the old hymns. If you were to look in the back of a, a modern hymn book, probably no, no less than half a dozen, maybe as much as 15 or 16 of the uh, songs in that hymn book come from Charles Wesley. Uh, Joy to the world, the Lord has come. That's uh, actually a Wesley book, uh, song, and on and on you can go. Uh, Charles Wesley uh, helps his brother out. Uh, John Wesley was a, is in a sense more the theologian. Charles more the, right, the, the hymn writer. And what was noticed, and why they're, they're called, a, called Methodist, is, is that the Wesleyans uh, promoted a holiness, a personal holiness aspect to uh, their believers and their followers. They are in their lifetimes within the Church of England. But this uh, holiness aspect, this regimen, this discipline of how to live a holy life, uh, coming perhaps close to perfection, uh, was called the method, the Wesleyan method. And so that term sticks and becomes Methodism. It's not unlike saying Mormonism is a, is a reference to the Book of Mormon in, in Latter-day Saints, or Quakerism, and so on. There's, these names get attached, the, the Methodist, and so it sticks. Uh, the Methodist, however, John and Charles particularly, John especially, is going to be anti-American Revolution. And so you can imagine in the 1770s, in the early 80s, uh, having your founding uh, father in, in your denomination being anti-revolution is not going to win you many friends in the revolutionary, revolutionary uh, and breakaway colonies. But by 1800, that had changed. And so what had happened was is that you will start to see in about 1801, there's a big revival out in Kentucky, but you're going to see these revivals and these what are called camp meetings break out all throughout the United States in the, uh, the oncoming years. 
But these, the, the thing that's going to make Methodism go, and the thing that's going to bring Methodism to the forefront is, is that they are very relatable. These uh, preachers are not really preachers who are going to be, <coughs> at least the early days, are not going to be sent to seminary. They're going to be sent out. One of the... Uh, uh, or one of the more renowned Methodist itinerants uh, describes this. Uh, this is what a Methodist preacher would describe himself as going through Tennessee and Illinois. Now remember, Tennessee would be upper south. That is uh, ostensibly slave and cotton territory. The, the facts are a little different on the ground on the cotton part, but you see where I'm going. Illinois, that is not considered to be a southern state at all, uh, though uh, very different. But anyways, Peter Cartwright says this about Methodist itinerants. Uh, an itinerant preacher is a traveling preacher. Another name you might put in your notes, a circuit-riding preacher. And if I had a blackboard or a dry erase board in front of me, I'd do this. You have a, a preacher one day or one Sunday at Jonesboro, Tennessee. X, that's one day on the circuit. The next Sunday you find him preaching over at Kingsport. Another uh, Sunday you find him preaching at Greenville and, and on in Chucky and so forth. That's all in East Tennessee. But he rides a circuit. He has an itinerary, uh, itinerant preachers. Uh, and Peter Cartwright, these are the evangelists of the Methodist movement, and they go out. And this is the way he put it. A Methodist preacher in those days, here we are in the 1810s and 20s, when he felt that God had called him to preach, instead of hunting up a college or a biblical institute, hunted up a hard pony of a horse and some traveling apparatus, and with his library always at hand, namely, Bible hymn book, and Myth Methodist discipline book, he started, and with a text that never wore out nor grew stale, he cried, quote, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. In this way he went through the storms of wind, hail, snow, and rain, climbed hills and mountains, traversed valleys, plunged through swamps, swam swollen uh, streams, lay out all night, wet, weary, and hungry, held his horse by the bridle all night, or tied him to a limb, Slept with his saddle, uh, with his saddle blanket for a bed, his saddle or saddle bags for his pillow, and his old big coat or blanket, if he had any, for a covering. Under this, under such circumstances, who among us would now say, "Here am I, Lord, send me"? That was the itinerant mission, itinerant, itinerant preacher who would go through. These very these western outposts, these mountainous towns, these small communities, middle-sized cities out east, these itinerant preachers, some dramatic is what Peter Cartwright just said, others less dramatic but not any less important, they would go out preaching the Methodist way. And this Methodist way is going to promote several things. Early on, you'll see these itinerant preachers, which, by the way, as I might have said already, but it's worth noting, Cartwright, if you notice, he said those preachers didn't go immediately to seminary. They went out and, they went out and preached. And I think that was actually part of the, the making of a modern America. I can do, I, there's an individualism there. I can do this. God has called me. And, I, and I notice how I emphasize the me, the I. And I don't need a seminary to teach me how to think, I've got the Bible. That is good enough. It, it, is, uh, it is good on the one hand. It could be a problem on the other. But at the same time, you will see this, that these itinerant preachers, some of whom who came from the laboring classes, could go out and preach to them, whereas a man who uh, maybe grew up in uh, wealth and comfort and had uh, the, uh, the most buttery of words could do nothing but uh, speak in high doctrine. And he couldn't speak to these crowds out in maybe western uh, Tennessee or Illinois or Indiana or Mississippi or wherever the case may be. They could, they couldn't, they couldn't do it. But all oh, that itinerant could, and so maybe later on he'll go to college, but not so much now. Anyways, uh, these guys uh, could preach, and these guys could make connections, and they uh, will sow many seeds. And the ways these uh, these uh, these Methodist preachers would uh, dress and appear um, is as they oftentimes dressed like a Anglican minister, uh, not completely, but they often wore black if they could afford the outfit. Uh, they often dressed in, in a certain way. They were often very much, they were opposed to drunkenness. They were opposed to licentiousness. They were opposed to, like, uh, they were opposed to lasciviousness. Basically, they were, they were, uh, they were to set a moral example. And if you've ever heard the term, uh, cleanliness is next to godliness, well, that was actually John Wesley, and he encouraged his itinerant preachers as they went out, his circuit riders, as they went out, for heaven's sakes, take a bath. 
And, I mean, if you're sleeping under a blanket of a horse, if you've never handled a horse before, those blankets can stink to high heaven. It's a good thing they took a bath. But those preachers cut an interesting figure, and in many respects, despite what we may talk about in a survey class about how Jackson does this and Adams does that and national politics was about this, that, or the other, <coughs> it was said by one historian, Daniel Walker Howe, that perhaps the most important uh, institutional figure that any American met uh, that was of a national scale was that of the itinerant Methodist minister or some other minister who was traveling and preaching in this time period. We may think it has passed on, and religion is uh, it was not it was not very important because it may not be very important to us. But for them, they were those Methodist ministers uh, or Baptist ministers or others to be clear. Uh, they were important figures in town, or when they came through. And these Methodist ministers, as they would preach, uh, they would do it oftentimes in the form of camp meetings or camp revivals. Um, these camp meetings, especially early on in Methodism, before Methodism kind of becomes uh, quote-unquote respectable, meaning they kind of calm down and lose some of their, their crack and pop and fervency, these uh, Methodist uh, revivals could be as vociferous as anything you could imagine. I talked about this in the form of the borderlanders, but it's a it's it's similar there is is that you will have some people getting in the spirit. These camp meetings could last for days or even sometimes uh, um, or weeks. But the fact of the matter is is that they will take place on the edge of towns. Uh, and, and really, it seems like well, this is worth noting that the Methodists really find their best inroads not in the cities, though they will send uh, preachers to the cities. Don't get me wrong. <coughs> But you will really find the Methodist inroads in small towns, uh, say towns of 2,000 or less. That's where they really make their hay. And arguably, they don't make it in the small, the rural communities or the little crossroads, nearly like to do the small towns. Uh, that's where they make the, their best. But they would open these camp meetings. There would be preaching. But remember this about camp meetings. And this is something that's always worth remembering about times gone by before, uh, you know, you have this is all being recorded so I can put it up on YouTube so you can watch it for an e-campus class. The fact of the matter is, is that before you have modern communications, a telephone, an iPhone or whatever, you have to make your own entertainment. And especially if you're a small community, a small uh, town, or even just simply somebody who lives out on a farm 10 miles away, you hear that a revival is making up. You may be interested in the religion, but heck, maybe especially if it's not in harvest season or planting season, it's kind of a lull and you can leave the, the, the house for a while, you and your wife and your four kids might get in the wagon, or eight kids, I don't know how many you got, but you get in the wagon and you travel to that camp revival. Maybe for the religion, great. But how about this? You go to meet other people, maybe to buy something, maybe for social interaction. Maybe you hope your daughter will meet somebody and they get married and you get her out of your house. I don't know. Point is this, is that these camp revivals have uh, impacts beyond the religion, but they go into the social, they go into the uh, the business, they go into the economics. It's, it's, it's a part of the warp and woof of the time period. But the fact was is that in Methodism... Uh, is uh, is big there. So you have these camp meetings, and so then you have these circuit riders who sometimes, uh, these itinerant ministers, sometimes who they themselves organize the camp meetings, and sometimes they don't. But between the appearance of a, a, a camp meeting or a, just simply a church service on a Sunday, there's going to be gaps between the, uh, the circuit or the uh, itinerant minister. Sometimes those gaps are filled by other ministers. I know from Texas experience uh, that you sometimes will have ga uh, Baptist ministers show up uh, and preach to a Methodist church, and a Methodist minister show up and preach to the Baptist church while the Me Baptist minister was riding his circuit. So that can happen. But oftentimes these Methodist ministers are not trying to be ecumenical. They're not trying to be general in the sense that they're trying to build everybody's church, they're often trying to build the Methodist movement. And so what you'll see the Methodists do and introduce next is what is called the class system. It does have, the class system has nothing to do with you know, rich versus poor, the class like a Sunday school class. The class, uh, which is kind of a small group, to use a different term uh, that was uh, in vogue, say, 10 years ago in church circles, but a small group that would uh, they would contact each other, pray together, preach. Uh, I say preach together. That sometimes was the case. They'd study the Bible together. Somebody could read 
uh, and on and I could go. And this was designed to cohere and uh, to, to knit together these uh, converts out of these camp meetings, revivals, and to keep the church going until the time could come when you could actually plant a church. And so obviously if you have the camp meetings and then you have these classes, they are... The, these are this is the embryo and the beginnings of Methodism in America, but once you've got the classes and you've had the camp meetings and the itinerant preacher come through and you've had enough congregants come together, or maybe if it's a community out west that's growing because people are moving west and already were Methodist, there will come a point in time sooner rather than later where they say we have to form a church. We have to go to church. We have to make a church. And you will find, like I said a few minutes ago, these churches, these Methodist churches all over, all over the, the United States in this antebellum period. As I said, I'll repeat the statistic to you. At the time of the American Revolution, you had about 50 uh, Methodist churches in America. By the time of the Civil War, you have 20,000. To say it a little differently, uh, using statistics as far as raw numbers, uh, or just uh, statements. The fact of the matter is, is in 1800, the Methodist movement was small. It wasn't the smallest in the country, but it was small. Several thousand is all. By the time you get to the Civil War, uh, about 2.7 million Americans identify as Methodists. That is a testimony to the itinerant preachers, the, uh, the, more, nor the more regular preachers, some of the itinerant uh, circuit riders who get married. Uh, they were often, by the way, the itinerants were oftentimes um, uh, single and then they get married, and they settle down, and uh, they start churches. You see this all over America happening again and again. It's worth noting, too, is that you also see with Methodism uh, a, a, an element that's there that's really kind of missing in the Baptist uh, movement. I'll talk about the Baptist more in just a second. But that is a role for women. Uh, it's true, actually, in all churches to some degree or another, and some of you watching this grew up in the church. Some of you still go to church quite regularly, and I hope you go all your life. But that all to say, though, is this, if you were observant, you noticed that it, a lot of churches are, are over, overwhelmingly female. Overwhelmingly might mean 70-30. Some churches not that pronounced, uh, maybe 60-40. But it's always, it's always been true for the longest time, certainly in American Christianity, that churches are almost always a majority female of some degree or another. And uh, you will see this in uh, some aspects of Methodism. You will see the exhorter, which is another kind of a lay minister uh, slot, yeah, an exhorter who is kind of a, a semi-preacher, an exhorter who will preach or give a homily or uh, lead prayer, can be a woman. And that is controversial. That's controversial. But the Methodists had that element in there for years. Eventually, they will go ahead and allow women to become ordained ministers, uh, but that exhorter role can be uh, there for women. Something else worth noting, too, is, is that you will find the, uh, the in Methodist circles, in the early days of the 19th century especially, but you will find uh, some Methodist ministers, and especially exhorters, again, those are kind of the lay ministers who are semi-preachers, they will be African Americans, some of them slaves, some of them freedmen, but they're free men of color. The fact of the matter is you find that, and that's kind of revolutionary in its own right. <coughs> but at the end of the day, of all the groups, Methodism is the largest pr uh, uh, Protestant denomination in America. By the time of the Civil War, they attract from the poor, they attract from the rural, they especially attract from the middle class, some wealthy, uh, small to medium-sized towns for the America of that era. Uh, they cast a fairly wide net. Uh, you will find them throughout the United States. You especially find them in the south and the west and the, uh, in the, on the plains. Uh, but they are, of all these groups, they are the most successful of them. And so one of the next things that we need to talk about is another one of those groups that's going to blow up and come out of seemingly nowhere. Um, and that group is going to be the Baptist movement. But before I get to that, I should have said this a minute ago. Uh, it talked about the church and how they do it, meaning the Methodists now, back to them. How did the Methodists do it? One thing that's really, I, I always need to remember to say this, sometimes I can even forget to say it a little bit, but the Methodists were what, are, what you can call in your notes Arminian. Arminian. 
They're not Calvinist. They don't believe, uh, Wesley especially, the founder, John Wesley, did not believe in a Calvinist ideology. He believed that uh, there was what's called provenient grace, that the sinner can make the decision to follow Christ himself. It is not the, the movement of grace in the heart that in, uh, creates the faith. It is our faith. And so there's kind of a free will aspect to uh, Methodism, Arminianism, named for Jacob Arminus. Uh, that you see, and it's very individualistic. I should really emphasize that point. I'll really get into it with a Baptist. But there's really an individualistic idea that I chose for Christ. I, fall, I decided to follow. I prayed the prayer. Uh, perhaps it's, the, in a sense, uh, uh, one of the reasons you have such strong American individualism. You do find that in the churches, especially in Methodism, uh, amongst others. So there are uh, many Arminians. Now, the thing is the Baptist, now back to them. The Baptist church, however, is very, very fractious. Some of you, maybe many of you who were watching this, grew up in a Baptist church or something like a Baptist church. It has been said over the years that the Baptist church, uh, the way it grows is uh, multiplication by division or divide and multiply. The Baptist church is uh, several things. First of all, the name comes, uh, the name the Baptist church or a Baptist church takes its name for the way it views baptism. Uh, the Baptist church especially does not view, uh, the, it does not have sacraments or anything like that. Uh, but its name particularly takes uh, from two of its ordinances. The one ordinance in the Baptist church is that of the Lord's Supper. The other ordinance is baptism. And you might call it in your notes believer's baptism. Not infant baptism, but believer's baptism. <coughs> those who uh, profess a faith in Christ, those who come to have a saving knowledge, a, a saving faith, that's, so those are all terms that the Methodists would use, but in this case Baptists were using. Uh, would be baptized, be baptized in a uh, creek or a pond. And for most Baptists, the vast majority of them, baptism does not confer salvation. It's just a act of uh, obedience, a symbolic act or a sign of your obedience to the commands of Christ. Uh, and you see, and you see, by the way, uh, believers baptism in the Methodist Church, but they also practice infant baptism too. But uh, that's where the name comes from. The, the Baptist movement basically takes it from believer's baptism, whether it's a child or an 80-year-old man. It, it doesn't matter. So that's, that's, that's in a nutshell. <coughs> but really, it's fair to remember that the, like the Methodist, the Baptist church has a large and long uh, history in the United States. It's a small history prior to the American Revolution, prior to 1800. But you will find Baptists in Rhode Island. Uh, Brown University, as I noted in uh, the discussion of the Great Awakening, what were some of the institutions born out of the Great Awakening? Uh, one of them was the, the colleges and universities we call the Ivy Leagues. Brown University was a Baptist institution. But the Baptists coming out of England were always a persecuted group, whether it's persecuted by the Anglicans on the one hand, persecuted by the Puritans on the other. The Baptist over its history, especially if you look at Baptist history, has had a deep distrust of official religion because they were never official religion. And so uh, this may surprise you that uh, in 1800, when Thomas Jefferson ran successfully for president of the United States, one of the groups that he uh, courted and was able to draw into his proverbial tent were the Baptists. And many Baptists uh, may have had doubts about Jefferson's own conversion and belief in Christianity, <coughs> but it is fair to say that many of them, uh, many Baptists, could live with Jefferson because he would leave them alone. And for a lot of folks, that's just good enough. You just let me do my religion as I see fit, as long, and, and you know, with certain parameters, of course, uh, I can do, I can live with that. Just leave me alone. And so uh, the Baptists over the years have been had a, a very strong distrust of official religion and too much government for that reason, if nothing else. But the Baptists have been fractious. Uh, the Baptists, uh, they're very independent-minded, as, as I'm already alluded to and now I'm saying. Uh, unlike, say, the, church, uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church, which has a pope at its head and is very hierarchical, pope, bishop, priest, and so on, and they run the church, uh, if you grew up in a Baptist church or something like a Baptist church, you might have even seen a church get in a, a fight, a split. Oh, I mean, the, literally the church splits and the co one part of the congregation goes away and the other church part stays behind or whatever. Uh, and they split over something maybe as big as, uh, say, Calvinism versus uh, Arminianism because there's Calvinist Baptist and there are Arminian Baptist. Or they fight over something about who can take the Lord's Supper. They split over that. 
Or they split over the role of women in the church. Or they split over, oh, how about this one? They split over what car- type of carpet should we put in the church when we build it. And that's actually, I take that from uh, my wife's uh, background. She actually knew a church that split over that issue. Uh, so this uh, idea of a fractiousness, uh, independent-minded, there is no pope that can go in. There is no head of the church that can go in and say, you Baptist, calm down and don't split the church over carpet. <laughs> in fact, actually, it's, uh, it's true to this day, Baptists are very uh, strong on this point. They make a very big point to the pro- uh, until 2020 when this is recorded. That most, the, very, the very many Baptist churches say, yes, we may be in a convention, we may be in an association, but we hire our own preachers and we fire our own preachers and we, do, we as a congregation, do what we want to and you can't tell us otherwise. Uh, even more so than the Methodists and certainly more so than the Presbyterians, the Baptists uh, have a history of, of having pastors come out of the ranks uh, As some of you may know or may not know, I am an ordained uh, minister, a Baptist minister at that, and I kind of follow in that mold. I I come out of the the ranks. I I surrender, to use the term, I surrendered the call of ministry uh, years ago when I uh, I felt the call in my life. Have I been to seminary? A little bit, but not much. I I read on my own and I do this, and I, and, and I, but I have preached before, and I've preached quite a bit before. All that to say is is that there's been a saying that's associated with these different groups, and I'm going to give it to you real quickly, but associated with the Baptist is where do the pastors come from? Probably in the 19th century, it is fair to say that the Baptist movement of all the movements had probably the least educated, meaning seminary educated, ministers in all of North America, of American North America, the United States. Uh, but here's the saying. The Methodist minister was sent to the people, which was often true, like the itinerant. The Presbyterian minister was called by the people, meaning there was like a pool of names of Presbyterian ministers that were ready and available in the congregation called them. And meaning this is going west now. And the Baptist minister came from the people. And so that would be like me. I came from the people. So all that to say, though, is that this, uh, the Baptist ministers, that was another unique aspect. Uh, a Baptist minister would say, I don't need to uh, have gone to uh, seminary. It's still true to this day. Uh, in small churches especially, it's certainly true, uh, in lar- some, somewhat true in larger churches, though you have Baptist seminaries, one at Waco, at Baylor, another in Fort Worth, and on I could go. But the Baptist movement in the 19th century, moving beyond the nuts and bolts of belief and so forth and practice, uh, one of the things about the Baptist movement is it really attracted uh, the poor. Uh, and it was uh, very attractive uh, to those who were, uh, perhaps you might say, downtrodden, the, the rural poor. He really found Baptist uh, churches planted uh, in rural communities, small towns. Uh, and, and remember this in the 19th century America, even though it is urbanizing, and I have said that particularly, the Baptist, excuse me, the America still is small town and rural in the 19th century. Uh, it's, it's shrinking, but it's still there. And so you will find in Texas or Mississippi or whatever, you will find Baptist churches seemingly everywhere. Um, you travel all through the South or even the Midwest in times, but especially the South, Upper South and uh, in the Mid-Atlantic, you will find Baptist churches 10 deep behind a tree. Uh, and so the, it's, the idea was in those days you just needed a Baptist church and uh, somebody would preach there once a month. That was good enough. You could ride and get to the church uh, after about a, a morning's ride without any real issue. All that to say, however, is, is that uh, the Baptist, uh, they planted a lot of churches. But I want to also add this too, is that there's not just one type of Baptist church. Some of you know this because you grew up in one of those Baptist churches that said, we do this this our way and we don't like these other Baptists. You're going to have, let me see if I can remember all the names that are out there. Uh, You're going to have, let's see. Mm -mm -mm. Ah, yeah. You're going to have free will Baptist, which means uh, that you can claim your faith uh, as an Arminian might, and you can lose it by your sin or action. Just the, the proverbial, as it's been argued over the years, a free will Baptist would be somebody <coughs> who would be say, in a, driving a car, uh, cussing and groaning and being quite human and quite uh, men of uh, feet of clay, has a car accident, dies, goes to hell. 
That would be an example of a free will Baptist. Uh, you might take the uh, extreme there. Others would say you're Southern Baptist. You come out of the South and you're, uh, you believe in the altar call. Some of you know exactly what I mean by the altar call at the end of a sermon. Come on, come down the aisle. That sort of thing there. Uh, and they would go. Uh, but you can't lose your faith. Uh, security of the believer. But you made the choice. You, I chose to follow Jesus. Others would be Calvinistic, uh, say primitive Baptists come to mind there. Those primitive Baptists sometimes could be so primitive in the sense that they would say, one, we do not believe in musical instruments. We will not sing with musical instruments. Though, you actually see in the early uh, to mid-19th century the introduction of musical instruments in most uh, Protestant-type churches. But primitives would say, and you see this actually with the Church of Christ as well, we want no musical instruments. Next up, uh, you would have, say, uh, a hard shell Baptist, which would be f independent, fundamental, uh, in, in modern sense, King James only, uh, that we, we, we agree uh, that there is a millennium coming. We do not associate with others uh, very fundamental in the sense that we are hard shell on certain particular issues. Uh, it just depends on the church and depends on what they're uh, uh, worked up about. Others may be two seeds in the spirit, American Baptist. Uh, and then, of course, also you may see um, uh, uh, hyper-Calvinist types who would say God will find his own. All the church has to do to save is just open her doors and God's elect will come walking in. So you find in there there's plenty more than just that. Uh, that you will find Baptist churches all over the place and of different stripes and types and denominations. And they proliferate widely in North America, and especially in the South and the West and so forth in this time period. They are everywhere. But the fact of the matter is, is that, uh, like I said, you're also going to see too, and this is worth noting too, is, is that uh, uh, with regard to these new churches, uh, there's one other, and I'm going to make a point of this because uh, Richard Allen is the man's name. Richard Allen was a Delaware slave. And Richard Allen uh, was uh, caught up in an, ev an evangelistic meeting, by in this case a Methodist preacher. And his owner also was converted in the same essential time period. And uh, Richard Allen eventually em uh, was emancipated, freed, his shackles from sin were freed, and what Richard Allen does is that he helps found the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME Church. Uh, Richard Allen is also a great songwriter and hymnist uh, in the same uh, uh, territory as Fanny Crosby, Charles Wesley, or Isaac Watts. Uh, and Richard Allen is going to be kind of, uh, he's going to be, th this is an African-American church. The AME church is Afri predominantly African-American. Uh, what you find there is, is that uh, in the early days of Methodism and the early days of the Baptist movement and other denominations as well, uh, say in the 1820s and the 1810s, you will find, even as late as the 1840s and 50s I've seen in Texas, uh, and that's on the doorstep of the Civil War, you will see these churches sometimes be far more biracial than they are today in some cases. Uh, you will see the, uh, a one preacher preaching that day. Maybe he's a black preacher, meaning he's a ma free man of color. He could even be a slave, but who was an exhorter and surrendered to the call. Other times he would be a, uh, a white man trained at some seminary, perhaps. But the, you would see in the church, prior to the Civil War, you will have slaves or free men of color, uh, depending on the territory you're talking about. They will be sitting in the same church as and it's worshiping at the same time as their masters or other white men and women, they'd be separated by, uh, by race, of course, but they would be sitting there all together. And so that's uh, worth noting, and you will see Richard Allen uh, at times uh, be as, as respected of a minister as some of his other white peers. Uh, and he, he comes out and he was able to shed the shackles of not just slavery, uh, but also sin, and, rep and he repented. And so you will see that happen. Also worth noting, too, is kind of how you have this cultural mix and melt, use the term melting pot going on, is, is that uh, people who traveled through the South during the antebellum period and traveled through parts where you would have a high uh, number of African Americans or slaves or freedmen of color plus uh, Anglo whites uh, in the area, you will see them say that these churches that were of biracial nature, um, the church I'm a member of right now, uh, actually, can, you can talk about the same sort of way. There was a biracial aspect to it prior to the Civil, uh, Civil War. <coughs> but you will see them, what's called lining out songs. 
they will line out the songs. And more particularly, put this in your notes, it's called lining out the psalms. If you're familiar with the Bible, one of the books of the Bible is a collection of uh, uh, Hebrew psalms uh, written by various individuals, and you would sing them, you would line them out and sing them that way. Now, you will also find at times it will be sung in a European style with a, sl a slave or a free man of color singing along with his white uh, neighbors or peers. And at the same time, you may also find in this church a singing of those psalms in such a manner and a beat and a rhythm that would be a qu uh, something that would be found not in Europe but in Africa. And so you have, and sometimes you start to mix those musical traditions together. And you see that in there as well. So uh, uh, you see the mixing of these so uh, songs and singing habits and so forth. It was all, uh, all interesting. Something else that's worth noting, too, is, is that you're going to have uh, not just singing by line, but you're also going to have the sacred harp. I probably will, uh, anyways, the sacred harp can be found anywhere, but it's uh, the do, re, mi, fa, so, la. And you may remember from uh, Mary Poppins or something like that, do, no, that would be uh, the worst movie ever made, which would be uh, The Sound of Music. That's right. So if you're ever wondering, The Sound of Music is a bad movie. So The Sound of Music, they have do, do a deer, a female deer, ray, da, 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 da. Anyways, but it goes... Uh, you basically will see people lining it out and they'll sing the tune, they'll learn the tune by Do, Re, Mi, and then they'll come back and then sing the song. And they learn how to sing that way, all a cappella for the most part. Uh, and it's very beautiful music, and you will sing, uh, see rather, uh, wide swaths of uh, Southerners and Midwesterners at times, but especially Southerners singing in that, uh, that, uh, that, sacred harp singing style. I'm going to probably uh, in include a song or two to so you get, understand what the sacred harp comes from, but it, it was all pre-Civil War. Uh, that came over on the boat too, so uh, there's a lot of cultural aspects that are at work here. This next part is true for Baptist, Methodist, and other groups alike. Something else that's worth noting in southern and western communities, especially southern communities long before the establishment of a public school system, you're going to see, and it would be also true up north as well, you would see the establishment of what's called a Sunday school. The Sunday schools, uh, as the name might imply, really get going after the Civil War, but they start in earnest before the Civil War. So if you ever wondered how people learned how to read and write, uh, some of it was by singing the lines in Sacred Harp, and, and that aids the literacy. But in this pre-Civil War period, this ante antebellum period, you're going to see a major push and a major uh, uh, interest in creating, uh, kind of like the Methodists did with their class system, you're going to see a major push and emphasis of educating the 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 church and that's through the Sunday school movement. So and remember this: this is true whether there are many or Calvinists, but they're Protestant. And what do good Protestants do? They read the Bible. How do you educate the church? You educate a Protestant church by teaching the Bible. Sunday school classes. Some of you grew up going to Sunday school. Uh, in addition to that, you're going to see Bible societies hand out thousands and thousands of Bibles that are going to make their way westward. A uh, family might not have a thousand books on their shelves. Heck, they might not have five on their shelves. But one of the things they probably had was, even if they couldn't read it very well, they could read the Bible because that's what they needed. Good Protestants read the Bible. Uh, famously, for example, Sam Houston in Texas history was a, a red man, but he, in his early days, he didn't have that many, he was not a wealthy kid. Uh, he didn't have that many books in the house, but one of the things he read was the Bible. Benjamin Franklin read voraciously the Bible, whether he believed it uh, in total or not is another story. And then also also very famously in the time period we're discussing, actually, he, a man who grew up in the household of a bunch of hard-shell, hardcore Calvinist uh, Baptist is uh, with Thomas Lincoln as the head. It was Abraham Lincoln. And Lincoln knew the Bible very well, mem uh, committed large parts of it to memory. Uh, was not a particularly Christian man. I would not call him a Christian, but the Bible is going to aid in American history uh, in this time period in not just the formation and the, the, the pushing forward of the church, but also in reading and literacy as well. But as you teach the people, and this is one of the things that you see with Methodism, Baptist to some degree, uh, and others as well, is, is that you're going to see these uh, virtues that are going to be try to be inculcated into the church. Uh, and by the inculcated in the church, as the church grows, inculcated into society, or at least reinforced in society. So this would be how 
Christianity, or in this case, Protestant uh, evangelical Christianity, in a sense, could be uh, uh, influential on society. Uh, so economically speaking, uh, we have, uh, you see, some basic premises that are pushed forward by these Sunday schools. Uh, you see it in the Methodist church, the AME churches, uh, the Baptist churches, they would say this, serve God in your calling. Whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. Another one would be, you work hard. Uh, in early in 1301, I might have used the term the product or Puritan work ethic, but you can also see in the 19th century what you might call in your notes the Protestant work ethic. Another one would be be thrifty. Don't be uh, a spendthrift. Don't be a waster of money. Be thrifty. Uh, buy, buy what you need, not what you want so much. And then another way to say it is, is you can say not just be thrifty on what you purchase, uh, but you also need to save money. So sometimes don't buy something. That's not bad advice. Uh, another one would be, some of you have heard this one before, you may believe it or you may ignore it. It's called basically don't get into debt. Don't get covered up in debt. That's always good advice. Uh, another one goes to the Ten Commandments. Be honest. Don't bear false witness. Be honest. Be honest in your dealings with man. Be honest with your dealings with God. Be honest in just your speech and pattern of life. And then for those who are employers, it goes like this. Treat your workers well. If you've got workers uh, laboring for you, don't try. If you made a lot of money and you could have the opportunity to, uh, uh, to, uh, if you, if you made a lot of money and you have the opportunity to increase their wages, do so. And then the next, and a companion to that would be simply be generous. Be generous. Be generous. So uh, all those are there. All those aspects, and those are, frankly, I don't know many people would say being generous is a bad thing. I don't know many people say treat your workers well is wrong and being honest and, and so on. Uh, and those were all aspects taught to, to some degree or another by these churches. But the last one here is, is that I want to uh, kind of give you an idea of the influence of women in the church uh, and, by extension, the, the leadership of the church as well. Uh, it is fair to say that Americans are going to get into uh, and promote temperance. The temperance movement begins in the church, though it doesn't stay there. Temperance, as many, some of you are familiar with already, temperance is the idea that we need to limit alcohol. We need to limit the consumption of alcohol. And for the, time, uh, the statistics I have, I haven't taken the time to look up late the 2020 statistics or something close to that. But Americans uh, consumed far more intoxicating spirits in the 1830s than they did in, in, the two in the year 2000. In the year 2000, Americans consumed uh, less than two gallons of hard liquor per year on average. In, the 18 in 1825, the average American male consumed approximately seven to eight gallons of hard liquor per year on average. Americans drank in excess, and they drank whether it's to get drunk, whether to have a good time, whether to knock the edge off because you had bad water, whatever the reason is, Americans drank and drank a lot. And so there was a joke amongst the Europeans that they referred to us as the Whiskey Republic. And you will see the beginnings of the temperance movement begin here. So here's a couple of quick, quick and easy things to go into, and I won't go much further than this, and the temperance movement begins prior to the Civil War. But if you've ever heard the term of a so-and-so was a teetotaler, teetotal, that is an expression of a man or a woman who took the total temperance pledge, that they swore they would not drink alcohol, period. Uh, early on in the temperance movement, some said, I'm for, a, I'm for a ban on hard liquor, but not wine. Others would say, I'm against alcohol uh, in beer and wine form, but not hard liquor, or vice versa normally. You can't run a, a, a temperance or prohibition society that way. You've got to probably go all the, all the hog for people to buy it. It's just what happens. And so if you signed your name, in my case, Nathan D. Giesenschlag, with a dash and a T, that means the total temperance pledge. You took the total temperance pledge and you were opposed to alcohol in totality. So therefore, uh, they saw your name signed into a ledger book at a hotel. They're like, ah, that guy's only going to be drinking water tonight. Hopefully it doesn't get him in trouble. So you have that. But beyond beyond the issue of alcohol and... T oh, I almost forgot about this. This you'll find interesting. So if, if you ever heard this ter uh, term from somebody who started drinking, they're off the wagon 
or you need to get back on the wagon again, quit drinking. In these towns uh, prior to the Civil War where the temperance movement was hot and heavy, a lot of ladies pushing it, men too occasionally, you will hear them say uh, they, they would literally drag a water wagon through the town encouraging people to get on the water wagon. So if you ever heard the expression fall off the wagon, uh, that sort of thing, that's where it comes from. But anyways, you're going to have a lot of other societies and other movements that are going to be born out of the church. So this is an effect upon society beyond the four walls of religion and the church. Uh, let's see, the American Home Missionary Society, a Bible Society, a Peace Society, Sunday School Union, Tract Society, which is like saying religious uh, uh, paperwork, Temperance Society. Uh, Anti-slavery movement comes out of these church, some of these churches as well, as you might expect. Some like the Peace Society, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's see, the Ladies' Association for the Benefit of the Pro- Protestant Half-Orphan Society. The Ladies' Association for the Benefit of the Gentlewoman of Good Family. Reduced in fortune below the state of comfort to which they have been accustomed. The New York Tobacco Society. The Society for the Encouragement of Faithful Domestic Servants in New York. The Seventh Commandment Society. And the Society for Returning Young Women to Their Friends in the Country. Both. And on and on from there. There were societies and movements in this. This is a very activist thing. And I guess I just spent an hour as the counter ticks on talking about the Second Great Awakening. If you thought the Second Great Awakening was merely about church, you would be wrong. It is about church, and maybe mostly about church. But at the same time, this movement is going to spread out in the country for good and bad throughout the nation and is going to have a lasting impact upon the United States well into the 20th century. That is just an overview of the Second Great Awakening, and it uh, sets us up for the next step of our course. You have a good day. We'll talk to you soon.